Remain standing with me. Remain standing with me. I'm going to let you get back to your place. This morning we sang a song. We sang just the chorus of it. And it's, oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. And uh, we just sang the chorus this morning, but we're going to sing the verse tonight and the chorus. But it starts off, I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene. Wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. How many of you still marvel at the fact that Jesus loves you? But how many of you are glad that he does, right? So you help me sing this song out tonight as we lift our voices together. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Sing it out now. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. I don't know if we have this verse, with, when with the ransom and glory. Do we have that verse, brother? You, this is the last verse. Now, I want you to think about this. When we're standing together in glory and we do see the face of Jesus, that song that we're going to sing throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity is going to be the song of the redeemed, extolling the greatness and the love of Almighty God. So you lift your voice and let's glorify Jesus tonight as we sing this song, this last verse. When with the ransomed in glory, his face I at last shall see. Twill be my joy through the ages to sing of his love for me. Lift it up now. How marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. Praise the Lord. You can be seated. Do I have someone, one person in each section perhaps that feels led just to brag on the Lord tonight before we enter into our prayer time? You want to say just a word for the Lord this evening before we pray? Who wants to share praise tonight and just brag on Jesus for something? It doesn't have to be in every section. But there's no reason for it not to be, right? Amen. So he'll be the first one. Just to... Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. No, you're cool. That's fine. I'm just kidding. Mm -hmm. Because I was thinking when I read 
Amen. Right. Praise the Lord. Two more, perhaps. Somebody wants to just praise the Lord and thank Jesus for something. Brag on the Lord tonight. Thank you. One more tonight. Maybe from a... Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir, Brother Arnold. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> sir, you see. <laughs> Having babies? Is that right? Ru what? Ru babies? There, well, I tell you, there's, a, there's several that are. If you're new and not having one, please don't feel left out. <laughs> All right. I'm looking for some new folks. Maybe one more. Anyone else? I, I don't, I don't want to rob somebody of wanting to bless the Lord tonight and just share publicly. Miss Darlene. Let's do pray for those families that were devastated Thursday evening. I can't imagine. Uh, I can't imagine that there's anything more that shows the brokenness of the human heart and the depravity of the human heart than a 15-year-old. Think about that, a 15-year-old that will murder his own brother and then strangers. Just only the Lord and those investigators know the motive. The truth be told, motive is not, when it comes to this, motive is irrelevant. It's just, it's heartbreaking. It really is. And so... Seriously, pray. Uh, we, we, we posted on our sign Friday prayers for Raleigh. And it, 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 I know communities all over the world experience that. And, um, but man, you know, 
People need the Lord. People need Jesus to intervene in their life. And that's, that's why uh, we have to reach people with the gospel. We have to reach people with the gospel. We have to see lives transformed from the inside out. And please keep praying for us and our witness and our life to be effective at, at sharing the gospel and loving people and being genuine and real. Uh, we mentioned Brother Robert Fleming this morning uh, who has an infection at our hospital. You pray for him. And, um, of course, I know you, you're, you're praying for Brother Kama Jones' family, Miss Ann and, and their family. And um, how many of you, you say, Christian, I, I have a request I'd like to mention tonight for us to pray for, Brother Arnold. Yes, sir. Is, did I see a hand back here? I may not have. I have a tendency to see things. Miss Rose. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Tell me her name. Peggy. Anyone in this section right here that has a request that you'd like for us to remember tonight? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Someone else. Yes, ma'am. Let's keep praying for Miss Miss Radford. In need of our prayers. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Pray for Michelle. Keep praying for Miss Sandy Hennett. This is Drew's mother, as many of you know. She's making baby steps of progress, uh, still at Rex Hospital. Keep praying for Miss Rachel Wade. Uh, Miss Rachel was moved to Willow Creek yesterday. Uh, you pray for her. I know Russell is trying to find a long-term care facility for her. And I know he needs wisdom, and this is weighing on him. And, and, and many of you have been there with aging parents, and just he wants to do the right thing, what's best for her, and you pray for him. I pray for Miss Linda Cash and her needs, and Miss Sue Flores uh, is still recovering uh, from her surgery, and Jonathan Manning battling cancer. Uh, Brother Larry Mitchell, you pray for him. Um, he is still battling brain cancer, but because of all the treatment that he has been through, uh, he has been diagnosed with a form of dementia that's beginning, and uh, he's really struggling with that. And you pray for him uh, and his dear wife that the Lord would just give them strength. And then Miss Jessica Clark's daddy, Mr. Jesse Murphy, uh, is under hospice care and needs our prayers. Uh, Miss Ruth Smith, let's pray for her tonight. Uh, Miss Becky Statton, you pray for her and her cancer diagnosis. And then I really want you to, I'm serious about praying for this coming Sunday, our anniversary Sunday, that we just would sense the presence of the Lord in a real way. Um, how many of you have an unspoken need, unspoken request that you'd like for us to remember tonight? Okay. Well, can we just join our hearts together as we seek the Lord in our prayer time this evening? Just Let's spend just a couple of minutes in silent prayer if we can.
Brother Craig, would you open us in our prayer time this evening? And then, Dr. Moots, would you close us in our prayer time, please?
I want to tell you, uh, as you turn with me to 1 Samuel, please. 1 Samuel 1 is where we're going to begin tonight. Um, as you turn there, I, I want to encourage you, don't ever feel discouraged uh, or uh, don't ever feel like that our prayer time is in vain or that it's not making a difference. Uh, I'm convinced, and the longer I live, I believe that a church's prayer meeting and a church's prayer time and the time spent in prayer as a church is the powerhouse of that church. I really believe that. And so I, I want to encourage you with that. I don't want us to be weary and well-doing. Uh, and I don't want us to ever, ever feel like that our praying together like this is not making a difference. Uh, I've been asked um, about, you know, about uh, even on Sunday nights particularly, why not giving a microphone to the people that pray? And we could do that. Um, I know people that watch online could, could hear what's being said and prayed, and I'm certainly not against that at all. Um, but I will say this. I, I, maybe it is necessary for us to people online to be able to hear people pray, and I, I'm, I'm not discounting that at all. I'll just say, I, I, I just, um, I don't want prayer time to ever get forced or mechanical. Are y'all with me on that? Uh, I, I think it needs to be, um, I hope when I pray publicly, I hope I'm way more conscious of his ears hearing my words than anybody else's. And I, I just, uh, I know some of you are probably thinking, man, well, we, we, well, we, we can't hear who's praying and we can't hear what they're saying, what they're praying. And I understand that. I get that. I really do. And uh, maybe we can come up with a way where it's not that way. But I, I I realize you can't hear always somebody else praying, okay? I realize that. But I, don't get discouraged in praying. Um, I feel like that the modern day church and even me, if, if I don't pray and I don't schedule praying, it, it's, it's probably not going to happen. And I'm convinced, and you are too, that what the Lord said in his word about my house shall be called a house of prayer. That when we're together, when we're together, one of the main, not just um, a secondary, tertiary issue, but a main issue, a main duty of us when we gather together is to pray and to come together and unite in prayer together and bombard the throne of God and to literally, I don't mind saying it this way, but to pray in the name and power of Jesus and to see strongholds fall. And so I just want to encourage you with that. Don't get discouraged. Keep praying. Um, thank you for your prayers. Thank you for being an intercessor. And uh, just, just keep praying for wisdom and Please pray that the Lord would just be preeminent in our church and that his presence would, that you and I would crave him. Here's what I know about the Lord, and you know this too. God will not show up where he is not wanted. He will not manifest himself if he's not desired there. And I know you've been in churches, so have I where I'm not sure they really truly desired the presence of God. And guess what? They got what they desired. I, I want to desire his presence. I don't always like I should, but I want us to desire his presence more than we desire our next breath. More than we need. A, I, and, and I know you say, uh, preacher, Write down on a list of, on a paper all the needs of faith church. Man, we'd be writing for a while. But you know, the greatest need 
the greatest need, the greatest need at the top of the list, the greatest need that encompasses the list is the presence of Almighty God, the power of God. That is what we need. If we don't have his presence and we don't have his power, you can stick a fork in everything else. Isn't that true, y'all? So keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. And uh, so thank you for just being faithful. And I, I realize that the majority of you sitting in this room tonight are past what we would call your active parenting years. Okay, I realize that. So I don't want you to tune out. I want all of us to be tuned in together. The Lord, in my reading this week, in my quiet time, with my discipleship group, this is, I'm, we're, we're in these passages of Scripture right here. And I've, I've said before that most of the Sunday night messages are going to come from my, my quiet time and my, my, my D group, my discipleship group. And so tonight is no exception with that. And just the Lord been speaking to me this week about this issue of some parenting pitfalls. So that's, if I had a title, that's what I'm calling it, some parenting pitfalls. Would you look with me, 1 Samuel? We're going to read verses 10 and 11. Please, please keep your Bible open because we're going to look at several verses tonight. But verse 10 in 1 Samuel, uh, obviously, or we know this is speaking of a lady named Hannah. Now, Hannah was married to a devout Jewish man named Elkanah. Elkanah was a good man, but he wasn't a perfect man. <laughs> And he certainly wasn't a man without problems because he had multiple marriages. He had two, two, spou uh, two wives. And any time, just remember, uh, as you're reading through your Bible, the Old Testament, and you come across these good, godly men in Scripture that had multiple wives, go ahead and know God blessed those men in spite of that poor decision. Okay, God never, ever in his word condemns polygamy. No, he never condones polygamy. Boy, I, I need to be careful what I just said right there. He always condemns polygamy. Some of y'all just woke up when I said that, right? He said, what did he say? God bless these men in spite of their multiple marriages. Never condones it. Always condemns it. Well, Elkanah was a good man. He was a devout man. One of his wives, Penina, had multiple children. Hannah didn't have any children. And she was deeply, deeply burdened. And it's, it's interesting. Uh, and uh, I, I don't, I don't want to... Well, verse 8, Elkanah comes to her and says, why, why are you weeping? Why are you crying? Well, Dodo Brain, it's because she, she's burdened. She doesn't have any children, and she'd like to have children. And, and uh, typical man, right? Look at verse 8. Typical man. Some of y'all know what I'm, what I'm about to say. He says, why are you crying? Why are you weeping? Uh, you're not eating. Why aren't you eating? Why is your heart grieved? Verse, verse 8. And then Dodo Brain asks this question. Am I not better to thee than ten sons? And it's interesting to me, she never even answers the question. <laughs> She's like, I'm not even answering that. I'm going to keep going, moving on. <laughs> no, Dodo Brain, you're not better to her than 10 children, you know? And by the way, ladies, and it's true, only, a, only an oblivious man would ask such a question, right? I, I, at least I had one honest lady in the room, right? So verse 9, Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, after they had drunk. It doesn't say after they got drunk, by the way. Some interpret that. Now Eli the priest sat upon the seat in the post of the temple of the Lord. And Hannah, Hannah was in bitterness of soul. And she prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. And she vowed a vow. She promised to God, made God a promise, made him a vow, and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look on the affliction of thine handmaid... And remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but Lord, if you'll give unto thine handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head, 
Now, we've seen that before in Scripture, right? No razor come upon the head. What, what, what Bible character do you think of when you read a passage like that? Samson. And, and, and what was that vow called? You might remember? It's called the Nazarite vow. And there were several stipulations about being a Nazarite. Uh, by the way, don't, don't get this confused. Jesus wasn't a Nazarite, okay? Jesus was a Nazarene. Then there's a difference. That means he was from Nazareth. Okay, but 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 uh, th- there were prominent figures in the Old Testament who were Nazarites. So uh, Samuel uh, was going to be one of those Nazarites, and and Samuel was a priest. Samuel was a judge. Samuel was a prophet. Samuel, as we'll learn in just a moment, was a very good man, a godly man. So uh, his mom Hannah prays to the Lord and pours her complaint, her heart, her burden, pours it out before God. Now, anytime in Scripture when you read or look at Hannah, she is known throughout church history, throughout Bible history, she's marked by this one thing, that she was a praying woman. She was a praying mother. She was a parent who knew how to pray and knew how to get a hold of the Lord. So uh, tonight, we're talking about parenting pitfalls to avoid. Listen to this statement. God's plan for your family, and God has a plan for every family in here, it is not automatically realized. In other words... It takes constant work. It takes constant vigilance. Harmonious coexistence in the family is not the end goal. Oh, man, if, every, if, if, if we can just get to the point where everything is just chill. Well, that's not the end goal. There's something deeper. There's a goal. There's a God-given goal besides everybody just getting along. <laughs> everything just turning out Okay. The dad is to be the primary disciple maker in the home. He's to be a man of the word, a man of prayer. He's to be, as one writer said, a church man, a church man. What does that mean? That means that he's characterized by faithfulness to and by involvement in the local church. And he, he, he gets his kids up he, and, and, and leads them and shepherds them. And he leads the charge for his family in a spiritual kind of a way. He sets the tone. He's the pace setter. He's the tone setter spiritually in the home. Now, I'll say this, ladies, uh, some of you perhaps, and or either you or you know a situation where that's not the case. Dad is not taking the lead or dad won't take the lead. Then, dear sister, you, you be the spiritual influence. You can. Don't let that non uh uh, his, his lack of spiritual leadership hinder you from being as a Christian, as a Christian wife and a Christian mom, who you ought to be. I, I, I am so thankful. And you've heard me, if you've heard me much at all in these years, you know, I, I've said before, and some of you were raised like, like me in a type of environment where in your home, if you didn't have the influence of a godly mom, you wouldn't have had godly influence in the home. Because it wasn't there by dad or stepdad. So you may know somebody who, who needs this kind of encouragement as a lady, as a mom, to keep being faithful and be for God who God wants you to be in spite of maybe sometimes what you feel like you have to overcome the negative influence or the negative attitude spiritually of somebody who is supposed to be your partner in leading and shepherding the hearts of your kids. What we're going to talk about for just a few minutes tonight, this obviously is not an exhaustive checklist by any means, but these are just some foundational principles that constantly need to be evaluated and considered in the context of our homes. And this is for all of us tonight. This is for grandparents and parents and and potential parents and even us young people. Uh, I don't know why I said that because I'm... It's for all of us tonight. This is something that constantly needs to be reaffirmed and taught and elevated in the local church to our homes and to our families. 
please, please note, I am not standing up here tonight as any kind of expert. I'm a fellow learner. So let me give you these three pitfalls to avoid that we see here in 1 Samuel. And we may not finish, but we will finish ultimately. First of all, avoid misplaced priorities. Avoid misplaced priorities. Hannah is an example of a parent who had the correct priorities for her child. So I see three things in in these verses about Hannah. First of all, be a parent who covers your children in prayer. Be a parent who covers your children in prayer. The the verses that we read are, are, are verses that give us a glimpse into her prayer life. I don't think this was the only time in Hannah's life that she prayed. I think she's given to us in Scripture as a lady who knew what it was to get a hold of the Lord. She knew how to pray. She knew how to get passionate in prayer before the Lord. It's interesting that when Eli, standing at a distance, was watching her pray, she was praying under such a burden, so intently, in such an agony, she really, really was praying. And those of you who have done much praying at all, you know what it is to be under such an agony in prayer. Her her mouth was moving, but he couldn't hear any words. And so Eli, not being the most spiritual or sharpest priest, his spiritual sensitivities being a bit dull, he thought she was drunk with wine. Totally not the case. In fact, he rebukes her. And she says, basically, sir, I'm not drunk at all. (laughs) I hadn't had any strong drink at all, but I'm pouring out my complaint to the Lord. And here's what I love about Hannah is that when she was burdened, she knew where to go. She knew to whom to take her burden. She knew not not necessarily that she had to go this way horizontally with her need, horizontally with her complaint, but she knew that the only one who could really take care of what she was battling was the Lord. She took it vertically. And and, and, and parents, grandparents even, those of you who carry burdens for your children and grandchildren, your adult children, your grandchildren, or even great-grandchildren, do not underestimate the power of your prayers. Get into the habit and develop and cultivate the habit of covering your children in prayer. Many of you remember when I say this name, you remember John Ashcroft. John Ashcroft, I believe, is from the state of Missouri, but served under uh, George W. Bush as our attorney general for a while. Very good man, a Christian man, a godly man. Was raised in a home of a man, a mom, and a dad who were committed to each other. They were committed to Jesus. John Ashcroft wrote even about this experience, uh, talked about that one of the vivid memories of growing up in his home was that his daddy would go down into the basement every morning without fail, go down into the basement and the way that the ventilation system, the heating system worked in their home, that everything went up and the heat went up and Every single morning, he said, it was our wake-up call. Every morning, you could hear dad down in the basement praying, resonating through the house. Some of you know what that is like. Some of you know the sense and the feeling of hearing your parents pray when they don't know you're hearing them pray. Some of you have memories of your mom or dad or even grandparents when they thought you were asleep, you coming, them coming in your bedroom and kneeling by your bed. And my wife and I have done this. Every parent in here that's conscientious and serious about their faith has done this for their children, gone into their bedroom and gotten down and gotten a hold of God on the behalf of your children. Keep doing that. 
Hey, grandparents, keep doing that. Hey, parents of adult children or close to adult children, keep doing that. Keep covering your kids in prayer. I remember hearing Dr. Hass, who was my missions professor at Southeastern. I remember in his kids, by the time he was my missions professor, his children were all in adulthood, all married, all having children of their own. And I'll never forget so many times him talking about that, hey, even when your kids become adults and leave your home, God still gives you a particular prayer burden for your adult children children and for their children. You see, I'm afraid that in 2022, maybe more so than ever before, it is so easy for parents, and I'm talking to myself, to get our priorities out of line. Sure, there are so many things that are, that are important, but let's talk about priorities. Let's talk about things that are most important, most important. Your children's social life is important, I realize that, but it's not most important. Your children's extra, extracurricular activities are important, but they're not most important. Hey, don't throw a hymn book at my head or, 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 or anything else. Grades, their academic success is important, but hear me, I mean, it's very important, but hear me carefully. It is not most important. What's most important? You tell me. Their relationship with who? With God. And yet here's the deal. Isn't it easy? Isn't it easy to pour in time and energy and money and we're running here and running there? And I know we all do it. We all do it. And we're, 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 we're doing all. A bunch of stuff that's important, but it's not the most important thing. In my Sunday school class and in some other Sunday school classes, we're going through a curriculum right now, visionary parenting. And the dude said this morning, he said this morning in the video, he said, our, he said, our goal, our job, our passion as parents is to make sure, make sure that one day at the end of time, in eternity, that we and our children are there in heaven beholding the face of the king together. Is there, any, hey, is there anything more important than that? No, is there anything as important as that? None. That we're together, together, mom, dad, children, and we're together beholding the face of Jesus. And yet, we put a lot of energy and a lot of money, a lot of effort, a lot of consciousness a lot of awareness and all these other things. And all these other things are good things, but they have their place. They have to be kept in proper order. Let's not get our priorities mixed up. Be a parent who covers your children in prayer. So I got to ask you, I got to ask you, I got to ask you, how often in a week's time, go back seven days, in the last seven days, please don't answer out loud, this isn't testimony time, just think with me, think with me. How many times in the last seven days have we, have you, have I called your children's name specifically, specifically to the Lord? How many times in the last seven days have you called out your grandchildren's name specifically to the Lord? Be a parent who covers your children in prayer. Secondly, be a parent who recognizes the principle of God's divine ownership. Be a parent, be a grandparent who recognizes the principle of God's divine ownership. Would you look down at verse 27, please, in your Bible? God, God, answers, God answers her prayer. Notice verse 27, uh, for this child, for this child I prayed. God gave her a son. God gave her Samuel. 
Hannah says, for this child I pray, and the Lord has given me my petition, which I asked of God. Therefore, verse 28, also, circle this word in your Bible, I have lent him to the Lord. Now you say, well, I know what that means. That means that she's lending, that that he's on loan from her to God. Is that what that means? It's what it seems to, it's what it seems to say, but that's not uh, the old English word lent. Here's what it literally means. It means promised or given. She's saying, because God has given him to me, because God has granted my prayer and given me my child, my son, because of that now, I am giving him, promising him back to the Lord. Our children, gang, hear me carefully, are not necessarily on our loan to God, they're on loan from God to us. And now we simply, y'all remember when we have parent-child dedication services, one of the very first questions we ask in this public ceremony is, do you recognize the principle of divine ownership? That is that God owns your children. That's biblical parenting. And Hannah said, I realize that. I realize that my son was given to me by God and I am giving him back to the Lord. And as long as he lives, he'll be lent. He'll be promised, given back to God as long as he lives. Here's what she was saying. I'm taking my hands off. It's like she would have come to this altar and literally laid her son on God's altar. And yet here's what happens. We stand up here, and I've done this. I've done this. I remember standing up here with both of our boys. Aaron and I standing here, both of our boys. And I'm like, in my heart, in my spirit, I give these boys to you, Lord Jesus. But how easy is it in the living of life for us to say, well, uh, here. And to reach back for them. I want to take them back. No, I realize that other than my spouse... Other than my spouse, my children are my highest physical, tangible gift from God. Given by God for me to nurture, to train, to shepherd them for him. I love this thought by Paul David Tripp. If you don't have his book, if you're a parent or even a grandparent, Parenting, 14 Gospel Principles That Can Radically Change Your Family. Very good book. He warns parents in there about taking what he calls the ownership approach to parenting. He says the ownership approach to parenting is motivated and shaped by what we want for and from our children. Listen to this. He says it seems right. It feels right. It does many good things, but it's foundationally misguided, misdirected, and will not produce what God intends for their lives. The biblical alternative, he said, to ownership parenting is what he calls ambassadorial Parenting. You say, what in the world is ambassadorial parenting? That's when I realize that from beginning to end, my child belongs to God. And I'm simply a representation of God in their lives. Parenting, you see, is not to be shaped or directed by personal interest, personal need, or cultural perspectives. Every parent everywhere has been called to recognize, he said, that we've been put on this earth at a particular time in a particular location to do one thing in the lives of our children. And what is that one thing? God's will. What is it that we pray that will happen in the lives of our children every day? God's will. We pray that. We try to structure our life around that. In other words, we're put on this earth as parents to prepare our children to fulfill God's plan for their lives. Not our will, not their will, but God's will for their lives. So if I'm not 
misprioritizing my priorities and misplacing my priorities. And I'm going to be a parent who covers my children in prayer. I'm going to be a parent who recognizes the principle of God's divine ownership. And then I'm going to be a parent who prioritizes my child's spiritual development. Would you look back at verse 21 as we come down the home stretch, and we'll just finish this other stuff later. So, verse 21 Dad, Elkanah, the man Elkanah, the father of Samuel, and all his house went up to offer unto the Lord the yearly sacrifice and to make his vow. But Hannah went not up. So, wait a minute, why didn't she go? Listen to what she said. For she said unto her husband, I will not go up until Samuel be weaned, and then when he's old enough, I'm going to bring him to the tabernacle that he may appear before the Lord and there abide forever. Basically, here's what she's saying in a nutshell. You know what? The child's going to stay with me until he's old enough, but when he reaches that point where he's old enough, he's going to go, and I'm going to do exactly what I promised the Lord I'd do. He's going to serve the Lord. I'm going to take my hands off. I'm going to put them in a place there in the tabernacle in the sanctuary around the other priests, these leaders, and they're going to mentor him. They're going to shape his life. It's interesting uh, that we read uh, here in these verses that, that one of the things that she would do is every single year she would make a little coat for Samuel. <laughs> I don't know how long it took her, how much she spent, but she'd make a little coat and she'd take it to him there in the tabernacle. That speaks to my heart because little actions, little decisions oftentimes go unnoticed by most people. But these intentional gestures of love and investments of time and care on the behalf of a godly mom and a godly dad, God is mounting all that up and it makes a difference in their lives. Your kids may not even be realizing it right now. But the little deposits that you're making every single day... <laughs> Moms, grandmoms, think about it. How many lunches, school lunches, have you made through these years? How many sandwiches have you made for your kids? How many times have you thrown a Capri Sun or a juice box in their lunch bag? How many times did you ask, you got your bag packed for tomorrow? You know, I sound like a broken record. How many times? Too many to count. You say, well, nobody ever even considers that. Well, let me tell you somebody who has considered that. His name's the Lord. Hey, and he says, hey, anytime you give a cup of water, it doesn't go unnoticed. You think he notices when you make sandwiches for your youngin'? Yes. You think he notices every time you pray and call your kid's name out to Jesus? Yes. You think he notices every burden you carry for the spiritual development of your child? You know that he does. And then it's interesting to me that she had him in the t -t tabernacle around spiritual influence. She placed her son in a position to hear from God. She placed her child in a position to hear from God. Right there, God called him. You know this. Especially nowadays, church is being downplayed. It's being negated. One of the things I love about being involved in the local New Testament church is having my children around good godly people, not perfect people, but godly people, genuine people who can come alongside Aaron and I and speak truth into the life of my children. I believe, I believe, I pray, I believe that my children and yours and your grandchildren have a good chance of hearing from God in their life if they'll simply listen. 
I pray that. I pray that. And grandparents, grandparents, some of you dear grandparents, you are speaking truth into the life of your grandchildren. Please don't diminish or think that your role is not important in their life. You may be the very, that may be the singular voice for truth right now at this stage in their development. You, you stay faithful. You stay with those godly biblical priorities lined up right. And watch what God does in the life of your child, in the life of your grandchild. Grandparents, you never want to usurp the authority of mom and dad. You can't do that. Okay? You can't be mom and dad, but you can be grandma. You can be papa. And you do that for the glory of God. Let's make sure as we pray tonight, Lord Jesus, help me to evaluate my priorities as a parent, as a grandparent, and make sure that they line up with this book. And all God's people said, let's stand for prayer, please. Father, in Jesus' name, I need your help. Please, apart from being a husband like I need to be, my second highest human priority is to be the daddy that you've called and created me to be. Lord, help our homes, help our families, use us this week even in the mundane, in the conversational times. Help us to be genuine and to walk with you and help our kids to see that we're people of integrity, genuinely. Not something fake, but genuine people of integrity. That kind of authenticity is attractive to our children. Father, please help us to be real for you and to be people who live and abide in your presence. And we'll thank you in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you.